Okay, we still have another minute, but I think we'll crack on. Uh, it's a great pleasure to um, welcome you to the next panel session, uh, which is chaired by Pete Round. I think Pete is probably known to quite a lot of you. Uh, retired at Air, Air Commodore, 30 years in the Royal Air Force as a pilot and instructor. Uh, he did a, a variety of quite interesting ground tours, actually, including arms control and interna international defence relations. Uh, he also spent some time in Europe and capability armament and as, as the capability armament and technology director. He now chairs uh, CLIOS Space and supports their uh, government engagement and provides uh, senior advice. Um, and perhaps the biggest news, which we probably all got in one tweet or another, is that he was uh, uh, enshrined as the president of the Royal Aeronautical Society just this month. Pete, over to you. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, having taken over as president of the Royal Aeronautical Society, my main project is to get rid of the Kipper corporate ties. I assure you, if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be wearing it. Um, welcome to uh, the afternoon panel, quite a short one. The title is Projecting Defence's Route to Delivering Its Capability Ambitions, Including Effective Collaboration with Industry Across Government. In other words, highlighting the Civ Mill approach. I'm joined by four uh, um, very senior and very knowledgeable people who I am not going to try and introduce. I'm going to let them do that for themselves. So we'll do a quick bit of that and then get straight into the questions. So, uh, first of all, Rebecca. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everybody. I'm Rebecca Evans, and I'm the Director for Space at the Department for Business, Energy, and Industrial Strategy. I'm delighted to be here at this uh, Defence Space Conference. Uh, and I think, actually, um, the fact that I am here is a testament in itself uh, to the way that we are working very closely between the civil parts of government that are interested in space and, of course, our <laughs> colleagues in the Ministry of Defence and um, UK Space Command. So I'm delighted to be here, uh, and I thought I'd just open by saying a few things about what we are focusing on in the business department and why our collaboration with our colleagues in the MOD is so important to delivering the government's ambitions as set out in our National Space Strategy course, which was published in September last year. Uh, and uh, I think the most important thing just to start out by saying is that I, I think we shouldn't, and I said this before, but I think we shouldn't underestimate, uh, underestimate the importance of having a joint National Space Strategy. I know Harve referenced this um, in his opening remarks yesterday. But it is really a step forward, uh, and it is just the start of a journey towards greater integration as to how we think about space, uh, whether it's our civil interests or our defence interests. Uh, and some of those things that we are starting to work on together as we take forward the strategy and, and start to implement it uh, are around how we drive decision making within government. So for the first time, uh, Harve and I uh, co-chair a board which brings together all of the decision making. There's a key uh, areas of decisions that still need to be made around taking forward what we've set out in, in our ambition um, in the National Space Strategy. We co-chair that bringing together colleagues from across other government departments, uh, whether that is FCDO, DIT, uh, DFT, Cabinet Office, Treasury, Colleagues come together to look at the problems that we still need to solve as we take forward that strategy. And I think you know, that, that we have locked in that approach to joint decision making, which will stand us in really good stead as we go forward. And then I just think um, the other point uh, before I sort of pass on to, to Natalie in a seamless fashion, the other point um, I want to emphasise is how we are starting to think about making policy and translating that into programmes. And I know uh, Natalie's got some thoughts on this as well. Uh, but um, some of the big policy questions I think that we've still got to solve um, as we, um, as we move, move ahead from the strategy itself is around how we deal with a national set of capability requirements. What does, that, what does a national set of requirements mean? That, well, to me, that means understanding what we need for civil uses of space and what we, what we need for defence uses of space and trying to bring that together, ultimately, into a single national capabilities plan. And that should sit between um, the sort of twin pillars of uh, a, a broader industrial policy, 
which my department is leading, but of course um, Natalie is, is uh, we're going to talk about in a sec, um, with very strong um, defence interest. What is our vision for the sector? What does that mean? What does it look like about the choices, again, that we're going to have to make over the coming months and years? And then, of course, the other part, as I mentioned, is the uh, establishment of programmes to deliver against our ambitions. Uh, so how are those programmes going to work? Which areas have we got a potential for dual use? Uh, what would we need to do? What would we need to think about in order to get to the point where we have a much more sophisticated understanding of what a dual use programme could and should look like in the future. So as I said, it's the start of a journey. Um, it is a, a journey that I'm really optimistic about and I think um, you know, we are committed to, certainly in my part of government, and I'm, I'm, I hope I speak for, well, I know I speak for Harve as well, in his part of, um, of government, it's a joint commitment to, to make this a reality. So I will stop there. That's probably enough. Thank to you very much, it. Natalie. Great to go ahead. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, a great segue into my, my own thoughts. Um, so Natalie Moore, Head of Space Policy at the MOD. Um, and just to reinforce really what Rebecca's been saying about um, just how joined up we are, because she mentioned the National Space Board, but underpinning the National Space Board is also a joint team that I, I co-lead with my counterpart, um, Cathy Bass in the Business Department, um, that supports that board and is also trying to drive forward implementation of the National Space Strategy and, and come up with a clear, a clear plan for implementation. Um, so yes, very joined up. Um, and a key piece of work that we're looking at, um, that Cathy and I are looking at together um, in support of the board, is to really unpick that first goal of the National Space Strategy to grow and level up um, our space economy and to, and to set out how we, how we go about that. So how we make the sector more diverse, more competitive, more resilient, more innovative, all the things that we've been touching on over the last, um, over the last couple of days. Um, and I wrote down what um, John Reeves from Viasat said yesterday because it really resonated in terms of what we're trying to do. He said, he said, we need a fundamental understanding of what government requirements are, what's the technology trajectory, so we can leverage commercial innovation. And I suppose the message is that that has landed, that has landed with us, that's exactly what we want to try and do. Um, it's, not, it's not straightforward, um, but we, we're sort of starting to get a, a plan together um, to, to, to tackle that, um, that thorny challenge and to do so jointly. And I think doing that jointly is, is so important, um, not least because of the, the sort of intrinsically dual use nature of the, of the sector. Um, we can't sort of draw a line down the middle in terms of which are defence companies and which are civil companies um, and the capabilities themselves. Are, um, are heading in an increasingly um, dual use direction. So hence, MOD and Bay is working very closely together um, on this piece of work over the, coming, over the coming months to try and set out what those requirements are. So taking the National Space Strategy as a starting point, taking the priorities that were listed in there um, by way of capabilities and, and breaking that down into, when we say SDA, what is, our, what is our absolute requirement? What do we want from it? What are our objectives? And, and working through those key capability areas and trying to ask those questions of ourselves so that we can give some sort of top-down direction to industry. Um, but we want this to be a, a very much a collaborative, iterative process, so not a sort of long-term long -term exercise that results in a big bang moment at the end, but a, a constant dialogue um, with, with all of you on what can the sector offer and a sort of a proper exchange of views and, and challenge on um, what are our requirements, but you know, can we deliver those uh, and, and challenging us on, on um, on what our objectives are. So, yeah, iterative process. We're trying to map out now really where those key stakeholder engagement moments are and how exactly we're going to go about that and, and still discussing that um, between us, but um, it's starting to come together. Um, and from a defence perspective then, we're also um, starting to look at that core question of when we think about own collaborator and access, the sort of subset of own that is what are the crown jewels? So what are the things that we need to keep onshore for, um, for security reasons? So the, the kind of capabilities, and this might be going to, down to quite sort of granular levels, um, what kind of capabilities do we, do we need the highest level of assurance for and, and how do we work through a process to think about that? And again, um, bring in key, um, key stakeholders where we can to sort of um, to, to, to challenge that that thinking and I know we've already been talking to some of you about um, about the plan plan for doing that so very much building on the defense and security industrial strategy what we want this to become the, sort of the, the starting point for a, a truly strategic relationship with industry as we start to define those um, those requirements both jointly and uh, and sort of the exercise we're doing internally within within defense 
Um, so that was just a sort of introduction to where we got to following on from um, Rebecca's thoughts, but we can pick up um, further in Q&A. Thank you very much. So from the centre to research. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Paul Keeley. I'm one of DSTL's directors. So DSTL, uh, you would have heard from Mike this morning, but I guess um, my sister organisation is DST in head office. DSTL's role is to deliver. That's probably my number one mission. We lead on delivery as a professional organisation for that. So I'm delighted to be here because out of many areas that are in my division, space is one that I've been working in myself for you know 20 something years on operational data at the beginning of my career, now enjoying leadership in the area. So we know what we get from certain systems and what we need. So I'm really in the mind of space, unfortunately, as a war fighting domain and an absolutely critical place that we need to um, outdo the enemy, think faster um, and outmaneuver. So what else does my division have just briefly? Because I thought I after Mike O'Callaghan did a brilliant job this morning of explaining DSTL, I thought I can't just repeat that. So what else is in my division? Definitely interested in AI. So myself, I sit on the Defence AI Centre, two-star board, co-chaired with Defence Digital. So we're also interested in the wider. I think that plays into the topic we heard. You know, that that is in space is interesting, but it's how it connects into a wider system that maybe if I go back to the OODA loop, the decision making is really important. My division also focuses on cyber, both forms of cyber, and it's in the public domain that we've avowed that DSTL is part of the National Cyber Force. So we have all sorts of interests and a bit like we heard from Alex this morning, I've had a career in RF and I'm definitely interested in what we can do differently. In today's session, though, I'm really looking at what we can do in the collaboration and um, We've got many ways that we try and do that in DSTL. You would have probably seen the innovative way that we've recently opened an office at Newcastle. Some years ago, we wouldn't have done that. We are working in the open in a university campus to try and get connection. Interested in doing that again. But we also work at the front. Colleagues of mine in the room work at places like RAF Witten or Deployed Forward. So DSTL is an operationally support in support to ops um, business. So that's kind of what we're here for. So what really makes a passion for me and what really uh, excites me is that genuine making a difference. And what I mean by that is not just for the military, but if I go to the political angle, it is genuinely true that the current government has invested in science and technology as an absolute theme. And myself, as a proud civil servant, I need to do the utmost to now show the benefit and the return on that investment. So yes, we can get caught up in all sorts of different who did what and how, but we must collaborate actually to actually show that this once generation moment that we've got a government in a unique position of wanting to do levelling up investing in science and otherwise of what can we actually do and the pace for that in my mind and our new chief executive Paul Holland said makes it entirely clear we might be in a new funding cycle but I reckon we've got about a year or 18 months to start showing the return on the current change of the integrated review so that's the kind of pace that I'm on because we must show to be able to take the step after the current period into the one after how it's already working on that timescale because that is the timescale that we need to see benefit on. I'll stop there. I look forward to the discussion. Oh, thank you very much. <clears throat> and those commercial pressures are only well, too well known for those outside working in it. Teresa, please. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Teresa Condor from Spire. We operate the largest multi-use small satellite constellation. So we have over 120 satellites in orbit. All of those satellites have multiple payloads on board, most of them related to RF data collection, but, but a number of other sensors as well. All of that technology stack is designed, built, and operated from Glasgow here, uh, here in the UK. Um, we also offer that infrastructure to other organizations, both commercial and government, so that they can deploy applications to space using our infrastructure, kind of like how you would deploy applications to the cloud using something like Amazon AWS. Now, I'm very interested in operational capability that lets you make better decisions. So there's, there's no point in just doing demonstration projects if you don't get to something that is real that lets you ultimately take action. And so I think that's really relevant when we talk about implementation of the space policy and how to build out all these capabilities in the UK. There's a lot of commercial organizations, mine um, and, and a whole bunch of other ones that have been here today and, and not here today that have a lot of assets in orbit that have capabilities that are operational or very close to being operational, 
And I don't think people realize how quickly the pace of technological change in this sector is moving. We generally say that the technology is improving 10x every five years, and it's very hard to conceive what that means in practice. But when you talk to a particular organization today and their capabilities versus six months from now, what they're able to do is vastly different. And so if you, you talk to industry and talk about collaboration, right now and, and, and try and plan how that fits into implementation of the policy, you're gonna lose out if you're not going very, very fast in keeping up with the dyna dynamism that is happening in the private sector. And I think that's a real challenge to taking action. And we heard earlier today what's going on in China and it is, it is breathtaking the, the change of where, where they were just a number of years ago and what the commercial companies there are doing, it's, it's on the skills side as well. And I, I definitely feel an urgency for, for the UK, for the US, for you know, all these organizations where we all have locations and care about what's happening to find, I think, a better way to move at pace for decisions. That's a very good point to uh, just end the introduction. So you've, uh, you've heard the introduction from uh, some very powerful players there. So let's uh, go to questions. Uh, I'll look to the room for the first question. I hope we're, we're not going to suffer from shyness. Oh, we are. Okay, oh, please. Thanks. Tim. <coughs> Hi there. Uh, Tim Morrison, Aerospace Magazine, uh, Royal Aeronautical Society. Uh, so just on that point of urgency, uh, a question really to uh, Rebecca and Natalie. Dual use, um, can you say something about the, the, the opportunities and the, 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 also the, the challenges of dual use in that if you are getting multiple agencies, civil and military working together, you know, is it a case of herding cats? And is it going to slow things down, getting people's agreements on budgets, programs, projects, everything aligned, when maybe the military just wants something, you know, a satellite up in, up in the air, up in, the, up in, the, in, in space, you know, next month? Mm. Do we you want to go first, I'll please? I'll yeah. that off. Um, I mean, I, look, I think, I think the journey to a truly dual-use approach is... Is going to be quite a you know quite a long journey and we're, we're at the start of that and I think what we have got to do and what we are in the process of doing now is identifying the areas where we can start to work together so what are, what are the the low-hanging fruit if you like where it makes absolute sense right now to work together and in some of those areas it's potentially around how we approach skills just as a just as one example and then as we develop our thinking on uh, capabilities again there will be some opportunities there to in 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 different at different speeds depending on which capability i think you're uh, looking at to perhaps try some um some p pilot some approaches or go in together to fund a small program because you're quite right to point out the funding challenges um, you know, defence and civil space are funded differently. Um, and, you know, that does make things complicated. But that doesn't mean that it's not doable. And so what we're trying to do at the moment, and this is a very live conversation, is we're trying to find areas where we can test the approaches uh, and we can, um, you know, we can potentially learn from those before we go on to potentially bigger programmes that could be established in future funding rounds, for example. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, we, are, we are working together, um, myself, uh, AVM Harv, Goddard, AVM Goddard and Paul Bate is the chief executive of the UK Space Agency, uh, have a regular conversation around this and it's, we are all committed to doing it. I said it's a journey and we just need to learn as we're doing. But Natalie, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, it won't surprise you to know that I agree with all of that. Um, I think, I mean, in principle, dual use is a no-brainer in the long term in terms of you know value for money and as I've said sort of the nature of the nature of the nature of space capabilities but as Rebecca says we're kind of at the we're at the early stages of working out what that means in, in practical terms I suppose I would say 
there are there are different ways of doing it so it's not necessarily about having a joint program you know in the early days it might just be a case of you have a program one department has a program but the spare capacity there in terms of the data provided or um that you sort of um create once use use many times so there are there are ways of being flexible in in pursuit of the same goals I think but I suppose the key message for me is that because we're talking so closely about this because we have joint governance we have you know we have a, a joint dual use working group where we're already starting to think creatively about what the opportunities look like and we're pursuing the sort of space sector space industrial policy jointly we're we won't miss these opportunities because we're we're sort of set up to find them um, but we'll need to think creatively about how we actually um, make them a, make them a reality. Mm. Paul, Theresa do you want to add to that or? Nothing significant no. about really. <laughs> okay, let's have a look for the room. Yeah, please. Thanks very much. Um, a, a question for all of you. I'd, I'd be very interested on the, um, the government side, but also, Teresa, on, on, on your thoughts from the private sector and looking at, at Spire. What do you foresee potentially as the role of, of ARIA, the new Advanced Research Inventions Agency, I know it's been delayed a bit, the, the British DARPA equivalent, for those of you who are not aware. You know, the way that's been set up to try to catalyze higher risk, uh, higher impact, acceleration of, of commercialization and, and RI activities. 800 million has been set aside for it. Is there a specific focus on space that you're aware of, what role do you see that it could have um, potentially in enabling us to, to deliver cross-government and on the, the civil military side, um, if you can share it with us? And, and, and commercially, what, what are your perspectives there as a, uh, as a new space company that's really driven forwards? Who'd like to go first? So there's probably many cool. angles. Did you want to go first? Um, yeah, okay, sure. So I, I can comment, and I, I have to say I'm, I'm less familiar about what is happening in the UK side and, of course, know much more about um, the impact that DARPA has had. And I, I think that kind of um, push from government around um, innovation and, and eventually procurement is super important in guiding how companies invest in technology development and innovation. And so I think, in principle, something like that is very good. And, and the only thing I would say is to, to kind of the question I'd asked earlier, I think it's really important to go from not just demonstrating something and once you've demonstrating it, demonstrated it, not knowing how you, how you scale it, let's say, in terms of government as customer. We can go scale it ourselves commercially. Sometimes it's going to be technologies where there isn't a commercial customer or it's a, it's a common good, or it's really a government defense or intel capability, in which case you need government procurement. And so doing one-off programs through, through that kind of fund is not helpful if it doesn't translate into the next stage. Paul? Oh. So I think for me, it's, my answer is going to be different in the sense that I don't think it's about the technology. I'm not sure that ARIA is going to focus on the military problems at all. It's not really within the scope in my understanding. But what I am really interested in, and probably too interested for today's audience, so I won't bore you, um, in the civil service it's really important what governance and freedoms we get. So um, Alex touched upon that earlier. DSTL legally is called an um, arm-length body. We have certain freedoms like anyone does. So for me, the most innovative thing that I'm interested in our area is how it might pioneer different industrial strategy freedoms or partnerships. So the actual technology or whatever it does, excellent. It will be awesome, I'm sure. But the, actually, the freedoms too within an industrial strategy, partnership, model, role modelling, how it can do that and to take UK and wider industry and academia forward to be <coughs> happy that that's occurring, we would then, frankly, and this isn't policy again, Paul Keeley view, we'd be then interested in how MOD can then roll that into other agencies and arm length bodies. So for me, it's a pioneer uh, in governance, which is a really weird thing for a scientist to say. <laughs> Anything to add on that? Um, I mean, n nothing. I agree with exactly what Paul has just said, by the way. Uh, the only kind of observation I would make is that, um, and, it, and it comes back um, to what was being said earlier, is that there is, there, is a sort, there is a once in a generation opportunity, I think, given the commitment that this government has made to R&D 
in general. Um, so there is a, a commitment to 2.4% of GDP to be spent on R&D by 2027. And that's that's quite significant in itself. And how we get to that point, I think, is, is still sort of under discussion, which government agencies contribute which bits, uh, what's, the, what's the contribution of the private sector and private sector investment in driving forward that um, growth in R&D spend overall in the UK. And I think that in itself is quite significant. And it comes back to what you were saying earlier, which is we need to demonstrate that that is translating into really concrete outcomes and we need to do that quite quickly and get on to delivery in order that that is maintained and not lost in potentially future um, settlements going forward. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to take uh, one f online so I think it sort of follows on uh, a little, particularly with the comment about DARPA. Uh, and uh, the online... Uh, Questioner anonymous, as uh, as aimed at Theresa, but I don't think we have to um, just go for her. And the question is, from a commercial perspective, do you believe MOD is collaborating effectively abroad? If it is, uh, great. But if not, how could it make it better? Well, so I, I think that's that's almost a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> not meant to be. <laughs> I think there, I mean, we, we just heard the, the panel yesterday about the amount of collaboration mm. and discussion that, that is happening uh, across Five Eyes and with NATO. And I, I think that that is super encouraging. And I, yeah, I, I think the, the recent geopolitical events have, if anything, you know, made that more stark and more important. You can always say that something can be done in a better way. Uh, and I think maybe some of the areas where that, that could happen is, again, if you think about industry collaboration, and it is also to one of the questions yesterday, is how, how do you work with companies that have a footprint in the UK, have a footprint in the US, have a footprint in Australia and in Canada, and maybe on the continent, and what is the right entry point? Do I talk to someone in the UK who says, oh, wait, I already heard you talk to someone in the US, so OK, just keep talking to the US? or or, or vice versa. And, and I think you know, some of it is, you know, talk to me when you have a full operational capability. And then in other areas, you might do a, a demonstration, you know, call it innovation project with, with one country. And it kind of sits in that country when there, there could be tag-ons to other countries to, again, use those assets that are in orbit and, and kind of share in that. Um, you know the, the use of those assets, even if they're they're used in different ways, and I think that could be one area where it's where it's done a little bit better. Um, you, you can always do better, right? Of course, yeah. Anyone I else can take it and avoid the going up yeah. and down kind. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, from my point of view, what I'm always reminded is that when DSTL was formed back in whenever it was 2001, we were formed to be the MOD's delivery collaboration partner internationally. DSTL wouldn't exist if there wasn't a need to have a civil servant centric collaboration with key partners and that's deeply in our bones well we probably would but one of the main reasons we're here is that and that's a, a, a role that we very passionately really work on and you've heard from Mike and others just how engaged we are with many of our Five Eyes partners but there's more that can be done I think in in your language we talk about kind of getting to the ultimate point of mutual reliance you know so that we don't have to invest in something in the UK because one of our partners is investing in it yeah. instead. So those kind of decisions are quite hard, not often made, but we probably do need to get to some of those more. But collaboration and international is um, just something we continually work on, I think is uh, extraordinarily uh, good actually where it works. Can I ask a, a quick follow up to that then? Is there, a, is there an organised method of horizon scanning? So rather than waiting for it to come to us that we look and uh, and find uh, be a capability that we might need. And do you mean internationally or in the UK? Internationally. So internationally, it's part of our collaboration. So from yeah. the Chief Scientific Advisor's office into yeah. the others, certainly I'm thinking more to the Five Eyes, we do that as part of that conversation. Yeah. So we do talk about the things that we're interested yeah. in. That is the start of the international collaboration yeah. conversation often. Good. And just to add from a sort of policy yeah. perspective, I mean, yesterday I think we... We heard loud and clear that international collaboration is more of an imperative than a nice to have in the space domain. Sure. Um, I think that came through strongly yesterday. I mean, one of the forums that we use 
um, which is very powerful, um, uh, is the CISPO initiative, which is yeah. um, the Five Eyes plus France plus Germany. Yeah. And um, I chair the policy and legal working group for that, which is incredibly valuable in terms of talking about responsible behaviours and that kind of thing. But there are also there's also a capability and architectures group. There's also an operations group. And that's really getting into the nitty gritty of yeah. you know how can we share what's yeah. everybody doing what capabilities are people de developing can we combine architectures you know so we're really getting into the um into the um detailed knitting of what yeah. everyone's yeah, um, doing so uh, live conversations um, excellent more to do i'm sure but and yeah, great. i'll just add i mean i think on on the civil side of what we do in space there's very little we do actually that isn't through international collaboration mm. yeah. Um, of course, we, we you know we work through ESA for quite a lot of what we do, but we've also got a number of bilateral arrangements with other countries, such as the Australia Space Bridge, where we are working on particular projects that are of interest of those two countries to try and progress um, what, whatever it is that we are, are trying to achieve. So I think there's a sort of multi-layered approach to international collaboration. But for me, it's as Natalie says, it's an imperative. It must be baked into our thinking mm -hmm. on, uh, on on everything. Actually, you know, whether it's a, a small um, a science program, science mission, at, you know, at the start of something, whether it's about how we're thinking about our capability requirements um, going forward, or whether it's about the really big picture stuff, uh, like the discussions through the UN about uh, the space environment. So there's a sort of multi-layered approach that we have to take. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Let's see if there's another one in the room anywhere. Please. Yeah. Get the microphone down here. It's on its way. Oh, that way. <laughs> that way. Fab. Uh, so Neil Fraser from NSSL Global. I'm not sure it's a question or, or a thesis and then for comment, um, but I'm going to say a few Cs. So what is capability? One is coverage and the other is commercial contracting and call-off. Um, so I'll give you an illustration about dual use. So worryingly, 10 years ago, I was the uniform lead for Skynet. Um, so the Queen's paid for this constellation is up there delivering next new HF. And it used to frustrate me when I used to go to Afghan and see all the deployed bases where other government departments of various agencies and stuff were not using Skynet because of partly cost, but partly commercial contracting issues. So that's a bit frustrating, so we need to get that right. And there's probably an opportunity coming up fairly soon to leverage that bandwidth for for other government departments a bit more than we do. On the other side, other side of that, NSL, we have a contract with MOD that we use to support the Foreign Office. So we have a flexible contract that supports them. They've pretty much emptied our shelves in the last few months, funnily enough. So we've got nothing left, nothing left to give to some of our other customers. So I think the point from that is there's opportunities now, and it's not just about shiny tin, it's actually about some of the dirty, grubby bits about commercial costing, service plans, etc. cetera. And there's real opportunity. I know that there's a, uh, the Cabinet Office have got a geospatial framework now that we're all meant to contribute to, but I think when you're doing some thinking, it's, some of it's like about cash and commercial models. Sorry, long transmission, but okay, I think there's you. a question. Uh, there probably was a question in there. Does anyone want to have a go? Or, uh, no? if, if I can, I can just comment. Uh, it comes a little bit back to this idea of there's there's capabilities and stuff out there right now that is available in the commercial sector and it's figuring out how how do you get that used by government both civil and defense in the right way in a, in a quick way in an easy way and and in a way that that is supporting industry and supporting national priorities and that that still does not really work yeah and I think what I, I haven't heard it in the room myself. So one thing I would share is that for me, uh, the people we need to name check is uh, D uh, Defence Digital and really clever people like Caroline Bellamy, the Chief Data Officer. For me, some of this conversation is dual use and otherwise will be the connectivity. So the digital backbone, our IT policies and otherwise, because we can think about different capabilities, but it's actually going to be the novel ways in which we might approach um, data centric security or the mobility of data in a kind of ecosystem that will be equally important. I heard what sounded like a really parochial question this morning, you know, does it fit into the RAF cloud? Well, why would anyone say RAF? We're defense. Why wouldn't we say defense digital? Why wouldn't we say saying backbone? That just, that just seemed to be an immediately narrow perspective. And you know, why that even? You know, where is the government one? So I think that's my kind of uh, okay. perspective. 
Yeah, I think there's a huge amount in that in that question, and yeah. sort of um, in terms of uh, not just thinking about capabilities, but the enablers that um, the neighbours that we need to worry about, which are, um, as Paul says, largely sort of cross defence rather than necessarily um, restricted to the to the space domain. But if we're looking at you know on a, from a space perspective, translating the defence and security industrial strategy into something for the space sector, then you know, those same principles will uh, will apply that were in the strategy around you know um, trying to make our acquisition processes much more agile and um, and we'll be you know, feeding into those and trying to do what we can to maximise opportunities to, to do that from a, from a space perspective. Um, so very much alive to those issues, I think. Let me just check in a question from online, uh, which is, so we touched on it, which is, do we need a space industrial strategy? And if we did, what would change? Uh, well. <laughs> well, um, uh, so... I think the answer, the short answer is, I think we need a clear industrial policy. Um, we don't need to sort of go into semantics here, but I think, I think we have a, you know, we have a clear strategy. There are uh, areas of that strategy, as brilliant as I think it is, um, which need additional detail and layering um, in order to, to bring some granularity mm -hmm to what that actually means in terms of the choices that government's going to make. And uh, one of those areas, I think uh, Natalie alluded to it earlier today, is that we are putting a lot of effort at the moment into trying to develop what we're calling a sector policy, but you could call it an industrial policy, yeah. uh, again, semantics, uh, which really is about trying to set out our vision for how we see the sector as a whole. So that's not just industry, that includes the, co the contribution of academia mm -hmm. as well. I mustn't forget that. Um, with the, with the, um, the additional sort of uh, dimension of collaboration sewn right through it. So what does that actually look like? You know, we've, we've talked a lot in the space strategy as, uh, as wanting a really strong commercial focus. So how do we actually translate that? We want to drive competition. We want to be agile. You talked about that. We want to think about how we procure in order to um, sort of support all of those outcomes. So I think that's the piece of work. And I think so the short answer is yes. <laughs> we, we do need to have that. We are working on it. Um, we hope to be able to have something to share um, more openly okay. with people sort of towards the back end of this year. But there are some choices that ministers are going to have to make within that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, we're still working through... Uh, exactly okay. what all of that means but yeah it's a top priority. Yeah. lovely do you, just, do you want to add to that yeah. because i think um, like rebecca the, the short answer is yes yeah. <laughs> yes we do i think that's we've um we've had uh, that message loud and clear from talking to the sure. talking to the sector i think it's just about how we then approach that um exercise so as i said rather than kind of a, a kind of go go dark and, and produce another um another glossy document in a, um in yeah. a sort of year or so's time we want it to be much more of an iterative process and i think again the message we're getting is you know we need to really it's the sector needs to understand what we need as government um, and yeah. that's not just you know that's that's through a range of lenses you know maybe from a sort of resilience growth yeah. leveling up perspective so, as iterative well iterative and collaborative yep. exactly yeah. so iterative collaborative but yes we do need to set out that um, yeah. strategic direction and, and that, that message is very much right. landed with us lovely Paul I was just going to add what, what I'd hope to see as well in that from ministers or otherwise is just the boldness to challenge those assumptions of competition mm. by default yeah. and partnerships I think the other one I'd put in there because I kind of um, I get it in the university context we heard from our friends at Strathclyde earlier but I do think we in defense that under the word IP are just outdated the fact that we transact and argue over words like IP or add value or more to the point industry feels that it's their primary route to maybe return Compared to other sectors, when I have friends who work in other parts of um, the UK, um, we're just very much, I don't think we're up to date in defence on our perspectives or utility of IP or why we keep seeing that as the only way to provide return. So I think when we go to those kind of conversations, IP is of, often, I'm sure everyone in here who gets some of their revenue from it's terrified, but from me, I've, I think it's important, it's useful, I celebrate it, but I think it's also quite a blocker, the way that we treat the conversation, to put it mildly. Mm. Mm -hmm. okay. and, and yeah. if I may just say that it scares me a little bit to hear people asking about another policy and another strategy <laughs> when it feels like more. we've been waiting for two so years for for, <laughs> for, or, or more for the other ones. And, and I, I get you, you need to have you need to have that overarching direction and prioritization, right? Because otherwise you're just, you know, spitting money, hoping something sticks. 
but you also can't spend so many years thinking about policies and strategies and you don't take action. And, and that, that worries me yeah. if we keep talking about more strategies and less action. Sorry, less yeah. print, just, more do. Can I just, just I mean, I, I <laughs> wholeheartedly agree, Theresa, um, and uh, the intention is absolutely not to do, go into a standstill while, you know, we think up some more great thoughts. Um, absolutely not that. Uh, we, we've now, um, for civil space, we've now got our three-year spending allocation as well. So th those programmes are being established. So the idea is that we will get out, we will start testing some ideas. Mm -hmm. You know, we won't be, as Natalie says, going into a sort of black box and thinking and then sort of coming out with a big surprise. The idea is we start testing this, we're having conversations, we're learning as we're doing, we're being iterative and agile. But the, there are certain things where we do need to bring some more definition in order to provide that sort of long-term clarity about where government sees the sector developing. Building on the, the high-level principles won't change, but I think there's some further granularity that we can bring that will help um, the sector. Lovely, thank you. Uh, another question in the room? I think there's one right at the back, yeah. Uh, good afternoon, James Black from RAND. Um, I've been working quite a lot on the whole kind of own collaborate access and how it applies to space. And as much as I'm loath to add further challenges to um, the complexities of international collaboration or cross-government collaboration, as an academic, I can't, I can't really help myself. Um, so one of the other dimensions, of course, is how we break down that stovepipe between space and non-space solutions to capability requirements so that it's not always space is the solution, what's the problem, but also so that we have that resilience, redundancy, and those, those alternative approaches that benefit space as well, and also give something different and kind of compelling to allies and partners. So I was wondering if you could just expand a little on how we're feeding in that non-space um, potential solutions. I know it was briefly alluded to in some of Mike's slides earlier, but it'd be useful to, to hear. Paul, I think. Uh, okay, I took you're on the spot. By the, yeah. by the use of the word <laughs> Mike made it clear that I... Um, so I think, you know, for me, we do use sentences. We, we could talk quantum, couldn't we? You know, we, we shouldn't need GNSS in 20 years if we sort our life out on quantum um, navigation. You know, that's the kind of promise that is often made, but when will it realise? But that's the kind of, you know, the timing and the navigation side often we should be getting out of. I think we just need to work out what our other modes need to be at times in different um, communications or ISR. So I think uh, for me, we are doing research across the board in terms of um, for the day when we don't have access to space is definitely a plan. I do agree, though, that when I go and visit different um, capability sponsored in MOD to make sure that they are understanding how they do link into the space command and into the space requirements is still sometimes tricky, even at the highest levels, to make sure people understand that space is there to support that war. So probably all I can say here. OK. Anybody want to add to that? No. No. Well, we are actually... I think I can have to say that was uh, the last question, but I want to give you all an opportunity for a few last words. But let's go the other way. Let's start with Theresa. Do you want to you got a couple of words oh, to sum up? Goodness, last words. Yeah. Um, I I think it's it's more to say there's there's huge opportunity for for the UK in in this sector, and I I think it's super exciting, and it does make me proud that that Spire is here and building our technology here, um, and I I think. There's, you know, now is the time to not screw it up, <laughs> and 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 yeah. so I, I hope that that we can all problem solve and not screw it up. Very good. <laughs> I agree. I well, agree. I agree with all that. I won't repeat the exact words, but absolutely spot on. I'll probably just finish then with a reminder. One of DSTL's core values is collaboration. So we are keen to collaborate. If you feel that we're not collaborating with you, your organisation or your ideas, that's not because we don't want to. We just haven't yet. So my apologies in that sense. We are available between the team that's here, myself and others. So we want to keep improving collaboration and be that international UK or otherwise. So never take that that we currently have as that, that all we want to do. We want to do more. We want to stretch ourselves, we want to hear, and we want to be challenged. So step forward and talk to us, please.
Absolutely. I mean, yeah. It was pretty much the same message I was going to deliver, actually, which was um, look forward to engaging with um, many of you as we take forward the work to look at um, uh, sort of the space industrial policy over, over the coming um, months. And, and don't be shy in sort of approaching us and, and being open about um, being, being open with your challenge, but also being open about the blockers to success from your perspectives, because if we don't hear them, then we can't find a way to resolve them. And that, you know, we really do want to do that. You know, if we're going to grow the sector, we need to understand the problems that the sector is facing. So um, be honest, be, be, uh, yeah, collaborate with us. Thank you. Rebecca. It's always hard going last, isn't it? Because everyone's said everything. <laughs> yeah. uh, I've eaten all your sandwiches. <laughs> uh, uh, I mean, collaboration has to run through everything. You know, whether that is uh, collaboration within government, whether that's collaboration internationally, whether that's collaboration with the sector, industry and academia, and all of the other organisations that sort of work with us in order to deliver our, our ambition. You know, we really, it is a big ambition that we've set out in the strategy, um, but we have to do that. And the only way we'll deliver on it is through collaboration. Well, thank you very much. And I think so we heard joint work across government, cross government is vital, iterative is vital. Uh, we've got to be dynamic. We must look a long way forward. If we're thinking about the bit that's just in front of us, we're too late. Dual use is essential. International is essential, and I think I sort of put Rebecca's statement in a different, uh, a slightly different way. Space is big. We've got to think big, and we're starting to do that. So, wonderful panel. Thank you all very much, and I hope you'll show your appreciation to them.